The Chicago Black Renaissance. The Renaissance was so diverse and so large, and uh, it would have been impossible. As the Harlem Renaissance came to an end in 1930, the Great Migration began in the late 1930s leading to the influx of over 1,000 African Americans to the south side of Chicago. African Americans who traveled to the south overcame economic and political issues like the Great Depression, and because of the Black Renaissance, African Americans emerged from music, art and dance, and literature. Although many cultural finding leaders like Richard Wright encountered setbacks due to those Jim Crow laws, Blacks were still capable of persevering through hard times while also making their culture practice an important foundation for today's culture. The economy status in the cities that African Americans formed was not steady, and there was much competition for employment since so many blacks were migrating from the South. For example, an African American in the urban North could earn three times more than what an African American could earn in the rural South as a factory worker. Homes became harder to find, and the cities were becoming overcrowded. Restrictions were soon in place to stop the influx, which prevented African Americans from migrating to the South. Many blacks wrote letters asking if they could be led into the South like this one. Ms. J. H. Adame, an African American woman, wrote this letter to authorities in 1917 to beg to be led in the South. But what she didn't know is that the South would become a devastation. Jim Crow laws and segregation was also in the upfront. The Jim Crow law allowed racial discrimination and did not protect blacks from violent organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Yet, African Americans such as Katherine Dunham and Charles White pushed for the acceptance of African American cultures and became two of many advocates for black rights and cultures. Music developed tremendously during the Chicago Black Renaissance starting in the 1920s. The music consisted of songs with a blues and jazz mixture. Because of Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination, blacks were not allowed into dance clubs that were starting to form in the mid-1900s. They didn't let that stop them. Blacks formed their own nightclubs. These clubs were mostly underground and kept secret for blacks only. It was African Americans' way to have a break from reality. Famous musician Louis Armstrong was a part of both the Harlem and Chicago Renaissance. He played his jazz music in black clubs. His style of upbeat, funky jazz dominated the music industry as we know it. Many critics criticized Lewis and gave racist remarks. Lewis didn't let that stop him from playing his jazz all around the world. Similar to Lewis is Earl Hines. Earl, also known as the father of modern jazz piano, was a pianist who played his music in black clubs. Earl played his music in an orchestra where he was later discovered by Louis Armstrong. The pair were unstoppable. They created many songs together such as Weather Bird and West End Blue. Hines had an unstoppable left hand that can play abnormally fast while still staying on beat. This technique was known as the trumpet style on the piano. This blues style of music was intended to soothe the soul. Thomas Dorsey, the father of gospel, wrote gospel slash blues songs that influenced blacks to keep on fighting, knowing that God would always be by their side. His most popular song, Precious Lord, moved thousands. Dorsey went through many milestones. His child died at birth. He was very stressed. This only influenced him to create more blues music. He created more than 400 songs. During the Black Renaissance, music kept everyone with their heads held high. Not only was music an essential factor in influence of African American cultures, but art and dance soon became a founding strategy to express inner emotions, stress, and depression. Self recovery was well needed after the Great Depression. Three essential figures who persevered and offered this recovery aid to blacks were Catherine Dunham, Charles White, and Gordon Parks. Catherine Dunham was an African style dancer and social activist who was born in 1909. She was inspired by the West Indies along with her Caribbean heritage and so she mixed them together. Dunham soon became known worldwide and eventually she got to perform everywhere. But that wouldn't have happened if Dunham didn't keep pushing even when she encountered an audience who had no interest in her, all because of her color. She fought the law and segregation with dance, which inspired many to do the same.
and because of this, Benz had become a voice for all blacks. Charles White was an artist who believed in art for change. Due to his beliefs and desire for change, he created the Southside Art Center in 1940 with the help of Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Project and historian Christopher R. Reed. White's past was not the brightest, but he made the best of it and made sure that his voice was heard at all times. Charles quoted, Playing Trump, I would go to the Art Institute of Chicago and wander about his art galleries, looking at paintings and dreaming of becoming an artist. I was very lonely in school, but I did find a small group of students struggling to break down discriminatory practices in school and joined them. Thus, at 16, I had my first experience in an organized movement to attack some social problems. Charles participated in the NAACP and became an editor of the Chicago Defender in collaboration with Gordon Parks. White devoted his life to helping blacks take a stand and express themselves, whether it was painting a piece of artwork or politically. Gordon Parks was one of those African American males who decided to take a stand due to the inspiration from Charles White. Parks was a famous photographer who was originally born in Fort Scott, Kansas, but he relocated in Chicago in 1940. In Chicago, Parks became a photographer for Farm Security Administration. FSA soon disbanded and Parks was on his own. According to Gordon's memoir, Parks got his inspiration from whatever he seen appealing or gave him a sense of feeling. After Parks' visitation in Chicago, he then relocated again to Harlem in 1948. Park's constant moving made it hard for him to have a steady income, but that still didn't stop his success. Parks focused heavily on taking photos on sports, fashion, and racial segregation, which gave him the opportunity to take photos of abolitionists Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. With all of Parks' trouble, he still persevered. He even launched his writing career in 1962 with his novel The Running Tree. Each of these figures exemplified the true dedication and strength that African Americans have to possess in order to overcome the struggles during the Black Renaissance, and because of these figures revolutionizing health solutions to cultures and impacted many. Literature played one of the biggest roles during the Chicago Black Renaissance. Blacks were finally able to express themselves through writing without being oppressed. These writings could be shared with the public. Various writing forms such as novels, newspaper articles, and poems were widely used starting in the late 1930s. Some of the most prominent writers during the Chicago Black Renaissance consist of Gwendolyn Brooks, Richard Wright, Arna Boltems, and Lorraine Hansberry. Gwendolyn Brooks, famous poet and novelist, was born in 1913. Brooks wrote poems and novels about oppression towards African American women, racism, and the life of middle class African Americans. One of her most famous poem books is known as The Street in Bronzeville. It has many poems. One poem entitled The Old Mary states, In the crowding darkness, not a word that they say. The poem refers to the overcrowded ghettos on the south side that were ignored by many. Brooks also was the first African American to receive a Pulitzer Award for poetry. This marked the greatness of literature during the Chicago Black Renaissance. Richard Wright was a novelist and political activist during the 1920s in both the Chicago and Harlem Renaissance. In 1927, Wright came to Chicago where he had the opportunity to write freely. Soon after, he published many novels including Native Son and Black Boy. These novels solidified the story of his childhood in the South, the extreme poverty in which he lived, racism and white violence, and his awareness of literature. Wright fought for what he believed in and made sure that the people of the South knew this through the Chicago Defender. The Chicago Defender was a black-owned newspaper in which Wright wrote articles. Wright's creativity and radical politics became the voice of the generation of African Americans and was the main chord in the Chicago black renaissance. Arna Boltemps, novelist, poet, and librarian, was a part of both the Harlem and Chicago renaissance. Arna influenced modern African American literature today. Arna wrote a number of novels such as The Story of a Negro and Golden Slippers. His writings influenced people to believing that they are capable of doing whatever they set their minds to. As literature continued to develop, there came other forms of writing such as playwright. Lorraine Hansberry was the first African American woman to have a play on Broadway. This play was known as A Raisin in the Sun. 
This 1940s play was basically about a black family living in Chicago in the 1940s. This family moved into a predominantly white neighborhood and faced racism and discrimination. Through this play, thousands found out, and this led to the beginning of the end of segregation. The evolution of literature solidified and foreshadowed in the later years that African Americans will be able to revolutionize culture seen today. The Chicago Black Renaissance was important then and is still important today. For instance, today's dance is still being influenced by great leaders like Catherine Dunham. Popular dance company Alvin Ailey was inspired by Catherine's African style of dance. They tour all over the world today, still doing the same African style of dance that Catherine introduced. Today's music still continues to be influenced by the Chicago Black Renaissance. Some artists like to mix old jazz slash blues with new school pop. Artist Bruno Mars does this in his recent song, 24 Karat Magic. It shapes Chicago as we see it today. <laughs>